take your Bible and turn to Revelation chapter 3 with me tonight. Revelation chapter 3. Last time we met together on a Wednesday, we looked at what and how to come clean with God. How to have a clean heart. Because not having a clean heart, not coming clean with God, will always hinder our spiritual life. There is no place in Scripture where this is more clearly taught than in this passage that I would like us to look at tonight in Revelation chapter 3. Here the Lord is himself addressing a church full of believers. These are not unsaved people that he's talking to. In verse 19, for example, of Revelation 3, Jesus says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Very clear in Scripture that God loves his people, and as a result of loving his people, he chastens them. That's what the Bible says. So we're talking about believers that are being described here in this passage that we'll look at. Obviously, in this church, as is the case in all churches, that doesn't mean that everyone that sits in a seat is a saved person, but it means that the majority of the people that make up the membership of the church genuinely possess salvation. They possess spiritual life. But this church that we're going to look at tonight is a church that is in desperate need of being restored to fellowship with God. You know what revival is? We just sang, do you really want revival? You know what revival is? It is to be restored into fellowship with God. It's to be put right with God. I spoke about coming clean with God last week. This evening, I'd like to speak with you from this passage about being put into fellowship with the Lord. I don't know about you, I enjoy very little on television. One of the things that I, and my wife does, enjoys uh, this as well. We enjoy watching a program called This Old House. We like to see how, you know, this old house is uh, completely renovated. And uh, the, the improvements, the home improvements that are made, and how it's done. It's very interesting to me, and I like that. You know what revival is? It is not home improvement. It's life improvement. It's God restoring not a, not a, a physical house, but his house. Because the Bible says that every believer makes up the household of God and that you are his temple. You're the place where he dwells. And so revival is God taking this old house and redoing it and remaking it, <laughs> reviving it, re renovating it, restoring it. That's what I want to speak from Revelation 3 about. Let's pause and pray. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity that we have to just look to you. We recognize that in ourselves we don't have the sufficiency to minister. Our sufficiency is of you. And so, Lord, we thank you that you are completely trustworthy. And we depend upon you tonight to take this, your word, and make it live in our hearts. Do what you see needs to be done in us tonight. Do it for your name's sake, we pray. Amen. 
So I want to look at uh, the description of uh, this church and uh, what you're going to find in looking at the description with me is this church needs restoration. This church needs to be restored. How do we know that? When we look at the description that we're going to look at, you're going to see a contrast when you compare the church's assessment of themselves with Christ's assessment of them. And the Lord does this by using some very familiar things to illustrate the truth that he wants them to see. So let's look at the characterization first uh, by jumping to verse 15 and verse 16 in chapter 3 of Revelation. Here's what Jesus says to this church. I know thy works. I know that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee or spit thee out of my mouth. Look at the familiar illustration that he uses to characterize this church. He uses water temperature as the analogy. Now let me tell you a little bit about this city where this church was located. This is written, verse 14 tells us, by Jesus to the church at Laodicea. Laodicea was part of a tri-city area. There were three major cities. Laodicea was one. Another city six miles away was the city of Colossae. There is a book in our New Testament called Colossians. That was a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the believers in Colossae. Colossae was six miles from Laodicea, and it was renowned for its refreshing cold water stream. Provided cold, refreshing water to the inhabitants of Colossae. Twelve miles away from Laodicea, there was another city called Hierapolis. And Hierapolis was famous for its soothing hot mineral baths that were natural. And people would travel there for the, the healthfulness of getting into the hot springs there at Hierapolis. Laodicea. Laodicea was an affluent, very wealthy city. But one thing it didn't have going for it was good water. The water at Laodicea, they had no local source. They had to store it in cisterns, and the water was pumped from Colossae, and there was water that was pumped from Hierapolis. And when you mix cold and hot water, what kind of water do you get? You get tepid, lukewarm water. Not only that, the water that uh, they had corroded their water pipes as well. It was very, it was corrosive. It was lukewarm, corrosive water. If you... If you are a coffee fan, and let's say you, you, you're anticipating stopping by Dunkin' Donuts to get a, a nice hot cup of coffee, and you get that cup of coffee, and you, you take the first sip, and you, it's lukewarm. You, you feel like going back and saying, I don't want this. Give me a hot cup of coffee, right? Or... If it's a, a blistering hot summer day and you're anticipating an ice cold glass of water and uh, someone hands you a water bottle and it's lukewarm room temperature water, that, you don't find that very refreshing, do you? 
Suffice it to say, Christ characterizes this church at Laodicea as totally unappealing to him and unpleasant, like lukewarm water when you want a hot cup of coffee or an ice-cold glass of water. That's the characterization of those verses. But I want you to look a little closer with me at this description, and I want you to see the condition of this church. Look at verse 17. Again, Christ speaking. Because thou sayest, the church at Laodicea, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, See the contrast? Look at the comparison between the self-assessment of the Laodicean church and Christ's evaluation of them. What a contrast. Totally opposites, right? How is that that we see ourselves in a good light often, and that's not how God might view our real condition? Now let me tell you a little bit more about Laodicea that's going to make sense when you see those, uh, those particular conditions that are mentioned. First of all, Laodicea was the financial capital of that particular district that it was in. It was a very wealthy city. It was a very affluent city. By the way, I have visited personally the ruins of the city of Laodicea. And I understand that in the Middle East there, that marble is like nothing. But I want to tell you, I was pretty impressed when I saw that their water pipes were made of marble. Their water pipes were made of marble. This was a very affluent city. Not only that, it was a city that uh, was famous for its garment industry, because in that region, they raised sheep that uh, produced a very highly desirable kind of wool. On top of that, located in the city of Laodicea, there was a medical school, and this medical school developed a treatment for eye diseases. It was a powder that they would, uh, they would uh, make into like a tablet that would be mixed with water and would be put like a, a poultice, if you know what that is, smeared on the eye to treat eye diseases. Now, I say that to give you the background for why Jesus gives the counsel that he does. The description of the church, now would you look secondly with me at the direction that Jesus gives this church. And for that, we pick up in verse 18. Notice the first three words. I counsel thee. Here, Jesus is giving directive. He is giving direct, I counsel thee. And in counseling them, he's giving insightful counsel to them. And really, what we're going to see it amounts to, he is counseling them, and in doing so, giving them an invitation to restoration, an invitation to be revived, an invitation to be restored into fellowship with himself. And there are two parts to his counsel, to his direction. I want you to note it with me. Verse 18, I counsel thee, first of all, to buy of me, to buy of me, to make a spiritual purchase, not a physical purchase, not a material purchase, but a spiritual purchase. By the way, spiritual things aren't purchased by physical things. You don't purchase spiritual wealth. You don't purchase spiritual goods by doing stuff. You can never earn it. It's not something you do that gets you spiritual stuff. And when he says, buy of me, he means to 
purchase this spirit, these spiritual goods by faith. To purchase these spiritual goods, to possess them, when you claim by depending upon the Lord himself, and he names three very basic but necessary spiritual commodities. What does he say? Buy of me? Purchase of me? What's the first one? He says, buy of me gold tested or refined in the fire. Gold tried in the fire. Again, this is spiritual commodities. When he talks about and tells them, when he gives them direction and insightful counsel to buy gold of him, you know what he's saying? He's saying, you are lacking spiritual wealth. They had a lot of physical wealth. They had a lot of material wealth. They had a lot of money, but they were totally bankrupt when it came to spiritual wealth. He's saying, uh, there is spiritual wealth that you're missing out on totally. There's spiritual provision and blessing that you can only possess when you claim it by depending upon the Lord. For instance, Paul would say in, in Ephesians 1 and verse 3, Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. All spiritual blessing. That is tremendous spiritual wealth. That's the gold he's talking about. Or out of the lips of Jesus himself in his earthly ministry, he said, I have come not only to give you life, but I have come to give you life more abundantly. That is the spiritual, that's the gold he's talking about. And how do you access that spiritual wealth? You can only do so when you depend upon the Lord himself and you claim it because he offers it to you. Notice he's, he also gives this direction to buy of me not only gold, but look as we continue in verse 18, and white raiment, that you may be clothed, and that the shame of your nakedness doth not appear. Now, they were probably dressed in the finest. They probably had a great, they would make a fashion statement, as we would say today, with their wardrobe. They had the ability to do that. But Jesus, his, his counsel is, you need a spiritual wardrobe. You are spiritually naked. And I think garments, raiment, how many times in the Bible do we hear that believers are clothed by the Lord, right? I mean, when you get saved, the Bible pictures that you are clothed with the robes of Christ's righteousness. And do you know that when we, as believers, one day will be there in heaven at the marriage supper of the Lamb, it's called in Revelation 19, the saints are dressed in white robes that the Bible says represents their righteousness. And so what I think he's saying here is you, because of your worldliness, because of your, your, your personal selfishness and sinfulness, you are spiritually naked. You need a, not only spiritual wealth, you need a spiritual wardrobe. And I think what he's talking about is he's promising them victory over their worldliness and their sinfulness. You know that holiness is possessed only when you claim it by depending upon the Lord to provide it for you? Did you know that Jesus himself not only gives holiness to his people, but he is his people's holiness? 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30 says that Christ is made unto us holiness, sanctification, or holiness. He is our holiness. And we have to access that holiness by faith, by claiming it, depending upon him to provide it for us. And that's what Jesus is communicating to these people. But look again in that 18th verse that closes with this. 
by of me also I salve that you might anoint your eyes with eye salve that you might see He's saying, not only are you, though you're wealthy, materially speaking, money-wise, you're lacking spiritual wealth. You need the blessing that only that, that I give by grace through faith. You're also lacking a spiritual wardrobe, although you're dressed in the finest. You're naked in my eyes, spiritually. You have really nothing to show for it. You also need spiritual wisdom that you might be able to see. I think that's what the ISAB is, is uh, referring. You need the spiritual insight and understanding, the enlightenment that God himself alone can give. You know, Paul, again, prays for the Ephesians church, and he says in chapter 1 and verse 18, he prays that the eyes of their understanding would be enlightened, that they would know, that they would understand spiritual truth. You can have Christ ISAB. You can have spiritual wisdom. How? You can buy it. How? By possess it's possessed when you claim by depending upon the Lord Jesus Christ the wisdom that he is made unto you. Again, he doesn't just give you wisdom. He is that wisdom. Christ is made unto us wisdom. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30. So, that's the first part of his direction. I counsel thee to buy of me. But it doesn't stop there. Look at verse 20. Probably the most famous verse in this whole section. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man or anyone hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Here's the second part of the direction, the counsel that he gives, insightful counsel. Buy of me. Secondly, open to me. Open to me. If any man will open the door. What does that mean? I think that means take positive steps to give Jesus access into your realm, into your life in its totality. You know, something that was very significant in the New Testament world was hospitality. It's still very big among some of the Bedouin people there in the Middle East. But this was important, the importance of hospitality, where you would just open up your door and your, your home to sometimes complete strangers, and you would, uh, you would give them everything and more than they needed. That was just part of the culture. Well, here, Jesus says, open to me. And if you do so, if you will take positive steps to give Christ access into your life and into your world, your realm, you know what he's, he's promised to do? First of all, he says, I'll come. I'll come. There's spiritual entry. If you welcome him in, and by the way, if you welcome Jesus into your realm, into your life, it's going to be a personal choice on your part. It's a choice to not just invite him into your life, but this is to give him uh, full 24-7 access to your, your world, your realm. If you open the door, I'll come. Have you opened the door? Or have you just slammed the door shut in his face? He says, I'll come. But notice what else? If you open to me, he says, not only will I come, but he says uh, in that 20th verse, I will sup with him. That is, sit down and have a meal. So, you open to me, Jesus says, I'll come. He won't come if you don't open. 
You can keep the door shut. You can keep the door barred. You can keep the door locked. He won't come unless you open to him, unless you welcome him. Secondly, he'll come if you open to him. And number two, he'll sit. He will sit. Come, that's spiritual entry. Here, he will sit, that's spiritual tranquility. People sit, that's a position of total acceptance of trust and complete dependence on one another. In fact, enemies never sat down and ate a meal together. Because if they sat down and ate a meal together, that means the fight was over. When you sit down, it's a position of rest. It's a position of peace. It's a, a, a position of total acceptance of one another. So Jesus is saying, if you will open to me, I'll not only come, I'll sit with you. I will bring tranquility. I'll bring my peace into this relationship. I'll bring my rest to you. You'll learn to depend upon me if, I, if I'm allowed to come to you. And then thirdly, he says, I will sup with you. And that means I'll eat with you. I'll have dinner with you. Come, that's his spiritual entry. That he'll sit, that's spiritual tranquility. That he will eat with us, that's spiritual intimacy. And here's why. Because to sup, to eat a meal in that New Testament culture was the highest form of fellowship and communion and oneness with each other. Because when you sat at a table in that New Testament world, you were sitting at a table that was about this high off the ground. And so you sat on the cushion on the floor and uh, you leaned on your elbow, and so you were leaning closer to the person, you know, next to you. And so as a result of that kind of positioning, uh, you recline leaning close to uh, the back of the person next to you, and they also ate from a common bowl. They, put, they picked food out of the same bowl to put it on their plate or whatever. And so, very important, what Christ is saying here is, if you will buy of me, and if you will open to me, I will, I'll come. You, you welcome me, there'll be a spiritual entry of Christ in your life. And I will sit, and you will enjoy spiritual tranquility, rest and peace with me. And I will eat, you will, you will know spiritual intimacy with Christ is offering them closeness. He's offering them intimate fellowship with himself. That's what he's saying. So, you have to let Jesus tell you the truth about yourself. That's exactly what he does in that 17th verse. They thought they were something that they actually were just the opposite of. Are you willing to let Jesus tell you the truth about yourself? You have to believe that the Bible is right in what it says, and it's not an exaggeration of the description that Jesus gives here of this church. To sum up this whole thing, what Christ's direction to this church is buy of me come to me you know what he's saying he's saying not only am I giving you counsel I counsel thee to buy of me to open them. not only am I giving you counsel I am the counsel I am the counsel buy of me Come to me. Come straight to me. Open the door to me. This is our Lord's invitation to your restoration. I want to, in closing, just read a little thought that uh, came to my attention again recently. This is 
from R.A. Torrey. He's long gone to be with the Lord. But he was a revivalist in the late part of the 19th and early part of the 20th century. Here's what he said. He went all over the world as an evangelist and saw God move in revival. He said, I have a theory that there is not a church, chapel, or mission on earth where you cannot have revival, provided there is a little nucleus of faithful people who will hold on to God until he comes down. He says three things. First, let a few Christians, there need not be many, let a few Christians get thoroughly right with God themselves. This is the prime essential. If this is not done, the rest of what I'm going to say will come to nothing. All right? Number one, let a few Christians get thoroughly right with God. Second, let them bind themselves together in prayer groups to pray for revival until God opens the heavens and comes down. And third, let them put themselves at the disposal of God for him to use them as he sees fit in winning of others to Christ. That's all. He says this is sure to bring revival to any church or any community. I've given this prescription around the world. It's been taken by many churches and many communities, and in no instance has it failed, and it cannot fail. If you want to be reminded what those three things are again, see me after. But basically it's simply this. Get thoroughly right with God yourself. Bind together with others that have done the same and pray for God to send revival. And uh, put yourself at God's disposal to win others to Christ. That's his formula. Well, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the words of Jesus here in Revelation 3. He said, buy of me gold tried in the fire, raiment to cover your nakedness, eye salve to anoint your eyes that you wouldn't be spiritually blind, but you'd be enlightened with God's wisdom, insight, and understanding. You said, open to me, that you stand at the door and knock, and that if anyone would open to you, you would come, you would sit with them, you would eat with them. There would be that spiritual entry that would, uh, that would bring about spiritual tranquility that would end in spiritual intimacy. What a wonderful thing. What great counsel that is. What a great counselor, wonderful counselor you are, we pray. Now, Lord, take this deeper into our minds and hearts and lives. For Jesus' sake, amen.